Okay, so let's talk briefly about the reactivity of enols. Uh, as I said in the last slide, uh, enols are going to be nucleophilic, right? So in that sense, enols really behave like alkenes, or at least like normal alkenes, uh, in that they are nucleophilic. They're willing to give up their electron density uh, and react with electrophiles. Um, but because of the fact that they are attached to an oxygen, uh, the enol double bond is, um, they're much more reactive than alkenes. Right, so let's just take um, a simple example here. Um, so you remember, uh, of course, uh, the reaction of alkenes with uh, bromine. Right, so react with Br2, and that goes to give an intermediate that has this bromonium ion uh, type of intermediate, and then Br- can uh, come in and basically open that up and give you a brominated alkene, all right? So that's, that's review from last semester. So an enol can do very much the same thing. Right? So here's our, our enol, generic enol. It can also react with bromine, right? So this is a double bond, just like that double bond. Um, and we could sort of imagine um, a scenario where we go to a, a bromonium as well Right, we could go to this kind of bromonium. Um, <clears throat> and what would happen in this case though, right, is, is this bromonium isn't gonna stick around. Uh, you know, it's, um, it's strained. And if it had something else to do, it would certainly do it. So rather than waiting around for an anion to, to open uh, the, up the bromonium, uh, the lone pairs from the oxygen can actually just kick down and actually open up that, that bond, right? So the, the uh, electrons can dump onto the to the bromine right so we would get to then our alpha substituted uh, carbonyl right after I after you deprotonate so so dump down and then deprotonate and you get to the alpha substituted carbonyl okay so that's sort of the the difference the the similarity between alkenes is that the double bond is going to react with the electrophilic br um, but then what happens afterwards is it doesn't it isn't going to wait around for um, the, the Br minus to open, it's just going to uh, open itself basically and then deprotonate. Now there's a slight variation um, to this, to this uh, intermediate here, um, which would sort of be the, the direct um, substitution. So we should probably just talk about that very quickly. Um, it's not clear which of these uh, would be best, but probably uh, the second one is going to be uh, more appropriate. So imagine instead of forming a bromonium, if we have Br2, if I just directly engage that double bond with the assistance of the lone pairs of the oxygen, so I just directly do um, an addition to that Br and kick off Br minus, what I can do in that case then is go directly to this intermediate without having to uh, actually go through the, the strained bromonium. So I personally like this option better um, than this one, um, but it's actually pretty darn hard to tell which of those might actually be occurring. Um, what I can tell you is that if this forms at all, it's going to open exceedingly rapidly. So, um, so rapidly, it probably doesn't even um, matter uh, that it would form that one uh, versus the direct substitution. Okay, so uh, we can react enols with Br2. All right, well, that all seems well and good, but how are we going to make use of this reaction? Uh, remember that for most carbonyls, that enol form is exceedingly small um, as, as part of the equilibrium. Um, so the question is, how can we utilize that for chemistry? Well, this does present a problem for most um, uh, reactions of this type, but the halogenation is one category where we can uh, actually make things work. So this is going to be a reaction where we can do the alpha halogenation halogenation of, um, we could either do aldehydes or ketones. Okay, so there's there's a couple ways that we can do this. All right, so let me show you. The first one is gonna involve the acid catalyzed um, uh, ketoenol tautomerization. So we take something like acetophenone and we treat this with Br2. Um, Br2 on its own isn't going to really be sufficient. And the problem is, is because there's not, uh, um, there's not a, a fast enough 
equilibrium between the keto and the enol forms. Now, probably if you waited long enough, um, I'm sure that this would eventually um, make its way over to, to the product. But what we can do to make this go just, just much more smoothly is to add in a small amount of, of acid. So this is acetic acid, acetic acid, okay? Just ACOH usually for abbreviation, right? So just a, a tiny bit of acid, that's gonna catalyze the ketoenol tautomerization. And what that then gives us is a very nice conversion to the alpha brominated uh, ketone. And then the, the side product here is going to be HBr. Okay, so that works uh, really well. And by the way, we can also use, um, so we can also use uh, iodine um, or, or chlorine. Chlorine gas would, would work here too to get those halogens. Okay, now in the case of the acid catalyzed um, reaction, uh, right with acid, acid, um, this stops after one halogenation. Okay, so we, we uh, if, if you notice, right, there's three alpha hydrogens here, and here we're still left with two, still left with two alpha hydrogens, and each of those could do that same keto enol tautomerization. And in theory, you could just keep accessing the enol form and, and potentially put on three different halogens. But with acid, it stops. And the question is, why is that? Why does acid stop after, after one halogenation? Okay, well, consider this. In order to do that acid catalyzed mechanism, what is the very first step that we do? Do you remember? We just talked about it in the last video. It's going to be protonation of that carbonyl, okay? So protonation of the carbonyl is going to be the first step but of course, um, after we've done one halogenation, we've got this now strongly electron withdrawing halogen substituent. So there's gonna be a strong dipole moment um, from that halogen. And that's going to also then pull electron density from that oxygen. It's gonna make this carbonyl way less basic. The carbonyl is already not very basic at all, but this is gonna make it massively less basic. And so any unhalogenated carbonyl is going to react much much faster than the already halogenated carbonyl therefore you get a very strong selectivity for just a single halogenation okay well what would happen if we did base what about the base catalyzed okay so things are, are different here so here we would start off with our um, our ketone. Let's just say it looks like this. And if we uh, do the first um, halogenation, so we can do Br2 again. In this case, we're gonna have sodium hydroxide as our base. Okay, it could be a, a number of different things, but this will suffice. So after that first halogenation, we would get to, right, the same monohalogenated product that we saw with the acid catalyzed. But what is the first step of the base catalyzed ketoenol tautomerization? Well, of course, it's deprotonation of the alpha position, right? It's deprotonation. And remember, for the same reason, that halogen is strongly electron withdrawing, which means that these are now more acidic. Okay. So this bromine pulling electron density away makes these more acidic. And therefore, once you've already halogenated once, that monohalogen is now the most acidic thing in the flask. And so it's gonna be deprotonated faster than the non-halogenated. So what that means is with the base catalyzed uh, halogenation, um, you, you can't stop at a single one. And in fact, you're going to go all the way um, to the to the tri halogenated um, material. Okay, so this this can't stop, right? It's a it's a reaction with a problem. It can't stop. Okay, and so this is going to go all the way. It's going to do it twice, and then it'll do it three times, and so you're going to go all the way to here. Okay, but now something something very interesting happens at this point because once you put three halogens on a carbon. 
um, that dramatically changes the nature of that carbon. Okay, it's now got three very strongly electron withdrawing substituents. And what has happened here is now that this whole thing has turned into a good leaving group. Okay, we're not so used to thinking about carbon as being a leaving group, but in this case, uh, since you've got so many electron withdrawing groups, it does may actually make that carbon right there into a good leaving group. And so what can happen then is we still have sodium hydroxide around. This now doesn't actually act as a aldehyde or ketone derivative. It actually will act a lot more like a carboxylic acid derivative. So imagine that the hydroxide can now do a nucleophilic attack on that carbonyl We'll push the electrons up here. And now we've got CBr3 as a good leaving group. And so when that tetrahedral intermediate collapses, it can expel the, the anion, the carbon anion, right? That looks a little bit funky, um, right? We're not used to seeing carbon anions be leaving groups, but in this case, it's got three bromines on it. So it's a good leaving group. And so that gets spit off and we're left with a carboxylic acid, right? So that's a little bit funky. We're taking, we're taking a methyl ketone, right? Methyl ketone and with Br2 and sodium hydroxide, we're going to the carboxylic acid, okay? That is a reaction which is known as the haloform reaction. Haloform. And just to show you Sort of without all of that mechanistic stuff in there, the haloform would be if I were to take again acetophenone, for example, and I treat this with Br2, or it could be another halogen source, and sodium hydroxide, or it could be another base. Um, and what I will get then out of this reaction is benzoic acid, and then the, the side product here. Um, which, which we really don't care about too much, is going to be uh, this molecule, which is um, called bromoform. Okay, bromoform. If it was chlorine, it would be chloroform. If it was iodine, it would be iodoform. All right, so a little bit of a funky reaction, um, but, but it, it uh, certainly can go with any, any methyl ketone. If you've got a substituted ketone, so ethyl or something more substituted, obviously you can't do all three halogenations and you won't do this reaction. So you need three halogens on there. Okay, so that's a little bit of enol chemistry. The problem is, is that in order to react with an enol, you need an extremely reactive electrophile like a halogen. Um, for weaker electrophiles, you really aren't going to be able to, um, to do anything useful for the most part with enol intermediate. So we need something that's a little bit more juiced up. So that's what we'll talk about in the next video.